Hi everyone and welcome to today's video on the graph, expectation and variance of a binomial distribution. Wow, that's a mouthful. Basically, it's a continuation of the videos with regards to the binomial distribution. That gave it away in the title, didn't it? Yes. So there were two videos prior to this and there were going to be two more before we move on to continuous variables are very, very, very exciting. So by the end of this lesson, what I want you to know, well, I want you to know what the graph of a binomial distribution looks like and possibly being able to plot one yourself. Now in an exam, particularly over here in Australia, the chances of you asked in an exam or the chances of you being asked in an exam to draw these things are probably slim to zero. But knowing the general shape will be useful both now and later on. And then there's formulas for the mean and the variance of a binomial distribution. Ooh, very exciting, I know. So in the last lesson, what did we do? We looked at the binomial distribution and we looked at the idea of successes and failures. And then we came up with uh, formulas and ways using Pascal's triangle and expansion of brackets and all sorts of stuff to help us get individual probabilities. Luckily, we then fired up our CAS calculator and we were like, oh, actually, there's an easy way of doing this. So that was good. And the example we used was the idea that let x be a binomial random variable, which says the number of threes thrown when throwing a standard six-sided die. OK, so the number of threes being thrown for a standard six-sided dice. Now, where did this table here come from? Well, it came from the idea that I was going to throw my die three times and I wanted to see how many threes came out of that. Yes, and we basically came up with the idea that we could work out no threes, one, three, two, threes, and three threes. How did we do it? Well, the long way was to use this formula here, where R stood for the number of successes we were looking for, N stood for the number of trials, and P stood for the probability of success for just one of those trials. So in this situation, the probability of throwing a three so for the example we gave, we would have had n there would have been 3 because we're trying to work out how many 3s we get for 3 throws. And p would uh, work out to have been, uh, what was that, 1 over 6, which we're not going to write like that. We're going to write as 1 over 6. And then putting that into my formula, particularly for 0, we would have had 3c0 times by the probability of success and we want none of those because remember we're saying no threes times by the probability of failure, or in this case not success, which is one minus probability of success, and in that case to the power of three. And we came up with the idea that this value here and this value here must always add up to that value there. And this zero and that zero should always be the same. And from then on, life was good. And it got even better when we were told we could use our CAS calculator to do all of this simply. Now, if you don't remember, whoa, go back and watch that video. Otherwise, let's carry on. Now, we can graph the results of binomial distributions for different values of P and N. And we notice, well, I've said this, that they're actually quite awesome. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to load up uh, Microsoft Excel, which I already have playing here in terms of my computer. So what can we notice here? Well, first things first, I've got my number of trials as 20. And I've got my number of or my probability of success as 0 0.4. And what do we notice? We notice that beautiful, jaggedly, randomly curve. Now, funny that if you remember seeing that before in the previous video, it looks a little bit like a bell curve, doesn't it? And that actually is going to come in really important later on. But what we can do is we can try and change our values of probability of successes to different values and see what happens. So I'm going to change my computer into tablet mode. That'll allow me to type. So if I now uh, click into here, bring up my keyboard and go, let's delete that and put in 0 0.3 and then enter. Then what we notice when I close my keyboard is that the graph is now actually further that way. Now, hopefully I'm pointing the right way, but it's actually got closer to zero. What happens if I change that to 0 0.2? Well, again, bring up my keyboard, changing it to uh, 0 0.2. Uh, hit enter and close the keyboard. And hopefully you will see that move over even closer. Yeah? And then what happens if I make that 0 0.1? Let's delete that and put 0 0.1. And you saw it there animate and it's getting even closer. Now, 
any smaller than 0 0.1 and we tend to find that we don't get that shape. We're already beginning to lose that sort of curved shape and we're trying to keep that curve as much as we possibly can. So if I change this value now back to uh, let's say uh, 0 0.4 again and see it animate over, there we got that, that nice curve. Now that's with 20 trials. You can see my graph here says 20 trials. What actually happens if I make that 100 trials? Now that's a pretty big value. So let's change that to, uh, not 700, that's a big number. Let's change that to 100. And you'll notice that actually now my graph doesn't seem to fit all of those on. Why? Well, I've got it constrained to 20. So what I'm going to do is right click on here, select data. Now I happen to know that my graph goes all the way down to uh, 105. 105, enter, and there we go. As quick as a flash, we now have a freaking awesome and very, very smooth curve. Now, later on, we're going to use the general idea that for binomial distributions with a large number of trials, we can actually use an approximation called the normal approximation. And that's a way, way, way far, far ahead. But the binomial approximation or the binomial graphs for small values of N and P, we use one set of information. And that's what we're dealing with today. So basically, long story short, we can use Excel to graph these things. And if you're interested in the formula I've used, there it is just there. I've highlighted up with that arrow. Now, Combin, that's my NCR business. And what I'm doing is taking each of the values and multiplying it with raised powers and whatever else. If you want to replicate this, take a screen grab and have a play. Now, looking at the graphs we've got here, I've taken sort of screenshots of each of those. So we've got an N here of 10 and a p of 0 0.3 so there we go there's my 10 trials and we have a probability of success of 0 0.3 now i don't know about you but this value here seems to be highest when n equals 3. All right so that seems to be the most likely outcome mm, most likely outcome where have i met that before Ooh. what about this one here well we got n of 10 and p of 0 0.1 moving it up well, that's interesting. That would appear to be at the point where n equals 1. Hmm, and what about this graph here? n of 10 and p of 0 0.4, and that's exactly at 4. Do you see what's happening here? Well, it appears that my most likely value, the one that I am most likely to, oh, I don't know, expect, is 4 in that situation. So 10 times 0 0.4 just happens to be 4. If I go back here, 10 times 0 0.1 happens to be 1. And hold on, nurse, 10 times 0 0.3 happens to be 3. And ladies and gentlemen, the life of a mathematician just gets so excited because, as I say, or what we've just actually worked out is, if we look at the graph, we can actually see that the highest value is the most expected value happens to be the value of n times p multiplied together. Here we've got an n of 20 and a p of 0 0.4, which would suggest that my expected value, my oh mu, happens to be the value of n times p, which is 20 times 0 0.4, and hopefully we'd expect that to be 8. And yep, if I was going to look at that one, and I promise you it is, because I've already done this before, that actually has an N of 8. Wow! This is so exciting. So let's formalize this. There's mu, which is also known as the expectation of X, happens to be N times P. It's really, really important that you remember those guys. That's for a binomial distribution. Yes, with, we'll say, small N and P. What about the variance? Well, I hate to tell you this, guys. I could prove this to you, but you'd need university maths, and unfortunately, way beyond the scope of this course. But what we do know is that the variance of x is given by n times p times 1 minus p. Now, again, don't worry about proving it. The point of it is it is n times p times 1 minus p. So that's interesting. Now, sometimes we might actually see this, and I do this occasionally because I think I did, had this in the United Kingdom, that we have this as n times p times q. Well, all you need to remember is that q is 1 minus p. Now, where have we seen that before? Well, we've had the p as a probability of success, and 1 minus p is the probability of failure. So this is basically saying the number of terms, or the number of trials, times the probability of success, times the probability of failure. And if I then wanted to go on and find my standard deviation, then what would I do? I would do the square root 
of the variance of x. This stuff is freaking awesome. So let's do a couple of examples. Darren is about to sit his VCE in mathematical methods. He's not. He's been there and done it, and it was called an A-level, and that was challenging. And is worried he's not done enough revision. Who does? He has decided that for the multiple choice of paper, he's going to guess all the answers, because that's sensible. Not. There are 40 questions in total, and each question has five answers to choose from. How many questions can he expect to get right? Oh, there's an interesting word, expect. So it's actually asking me to find my expected value, which is mu. We know it's binomial, so we're going to have n times p, because I'm either going to get things right or wrong. What is the number of questions? Number of trials, well, 40 questions times the probability I am going to get an answer right. Well, the great thing is, if I've got five answers to choose from, from any particular question, that I know my probability of success, my probability of choosing something correctly, is 1 over 5. So I'm going to multiply that by 1 over 5, which just so happens to give me 8. So for any 40 questions with five appropriate responses or five responses, the chances of me getting, um, getting correct are eight questions. Now, I don't know about you, but 8 over 40 is only 20%. So continuing on, how do we then find the variance of x? Well, we know that the variance of x is equal to n times p times 1 minus p, which gives me n was 40 times p, which was 1 over 5, times 1 minus p, which is 4 over 5, which is going to give me, well, firing up my CAVS calculator, which I am want to be able to do, 40 times fractions 1 over 5. Now, the reason I'm doing it in a fraction is because uh, my question was given in a fraction. And with most exams, we have to give things in exact uh, values. Otherwise, life gets interesting. Now, you're going to notice that my calculator uh, came up with 6.4. That's because I'm not in the right mode. So I ch changed the mode down there at the bottom of my calculator. And that gave me 32 over 5. So I'm going to write my answer there as 32 on 5 which if we wanted to was 6.4, depending on how the question actually gave it to us. So there's the basics of finding mean and uh, variance and standard deviation if I wanted to for a binomial distribution. Let's look at this example from the Cambridge te textbook, which again, thank you very much, Cambridge. I'm using your textbook for my lessons and it is freaking awesome. So the probability of contracting influenza this winter is known to be 0 0.2. So we're going to write down that P equals 0 0.2. I'm fairly sure that's going to be the po po uh, my probability of success. Of the 100 employees, so n is 100, although that looks like h, how many would the owner expect to get influenza? So how many would the owner expect to get influenza? The minute I see expectation, mu is equal to n times p, because they're either going to get flu or they're not, so it's binomial. So it's 100 times uh, 0 0.2. So 0.2 is equal to 20. Yes, so he would expect 20 people to get uh, influenza. That's not to say that 20 people will get it, but that seems to be what the probability suggests. Then find the standard deviation of the number of people who will get influenza and calculate mu plus or minus two sigma. Now, if you remember back from a previous lesson, uh, we know that certain percentages of um, people fit within certain standard deviations of our mean. And that's what this is effectively saying plus or minus two standard deviations of my mean. A quick bell curve, that's a horrible bell curve, will give me minus two standard deviations and two standard deviations. So we're looking at sort of that area there, or the number of people either side of the mean. So first things first, we've already got the mean value, thank you very much, I need to find my sigma. To find my sigma, I need to find my variance. So we know the variance uh, of, let's call it x, is going to be n times p times 1 minus p. That's going to give me n, we said was 100, p was 0 0.2, and 1 minus p is 0 0.8. Loading up my CAS calculator, we are going to do uh, 100 times 0.2 times 0.8 gives me 16. So that's my variance, but that doesn't really mean anything to me at the moment of time because I need to get it to my standard deviation, which is the variance of x which is the square root of 16, which lovely happens to be 4. That's quite nice. Thank you very much. So we now want to work out mu plus or minus 2 sigma. Well, mu uh, minus 2 sigma, I always work out the minus 1 first, is now going to give me 20 was my expected minus 2 lots of 4, 
which is 8, which gives me 12, and mu plus 2 sigma would be 20 plus 2 lots of 4, which is 28. And so we would, as the question suggests, what does it say here? Uh, find the standard deviation of the number of the people, interpret the interval for this example. So the interval would be from 12 to 28. So what we're saying is, going back to this idea of sort of how much data falls between uh, two standard deviations of the mean, if you don't remember, go back to the previous video. The rule is 68, 95, 99.7%. So two standard deviations is 95%. So we are 95% sure, or there's a 95% certainty that between 12 and 28 people will contract influenza this flu season. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was a freaking awesome lesson. I really enjoyed that. But what did we deal with? The graph and expectation and variance of the binomial distribution. Ladies and gentlemen, on Patreon, if you can do anything to help, that would be awesome. Even if you actually get out there and ask friends to subscribe, I'll be so, so happy. Thank you very much. Subscribe, did you say? Well, why not? If you haven't already done so, why not hit that circle there that says Maths Guru? And if you're not interested in subscribing, I won't hold it against you. Don't worry about it. There's another video for you to watch. Lots of information in the description below. If you liked it, leave a comment. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you next time.